The film introduction contains several photographs of President Kennedy and President Johnson addressing crowds, meeting with key leaders, and at work in their offices. A uniformed park ranger appears in front of a visual background of student protesters. In the Great Society special webisode series. During these webisodes, we will be comparing JFK and LBJ and examining them from a human perspective. Today, we will focus on the establishment of the National Park Service sites and the presidential libraries. Today, we have Park Ranger Jonathan Straff from the John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site and Park Ranger Joseph Owen from the Lyndon Baines Johnson National Historical Park. We also have Alan Price, the director of the JFK Library and Museum, and we have Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Library and Museum as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Joy. Great to be here. I am Joy Kennard, and I'm the superintendent of the Central Alabama Civil Rights Sites. And today we're just going to jump right into our conversation. What are the origin stories of the JFK National Historic Site, the LBJ National Historical Park, the JFK Presidential Library and Museum, and the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library and Museum. So, Joy, I'll go ahead and start since it appears that the A uniform park ranger in front of a visual um, background so, of JFK's uh, birthplace. Joy, a gray, three-story well. house with dark um, green right shutters. Me here is, uh, is the house itself. Um, and this is the birthplace of the 35th president of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Um, and this is the how the house appeared uh, when the family lived there and how the house appears uh, right now, as a matter of fact. Um, so the family will live in this house until Jack Kennedy is three and a half years of age, and they'll move to a larger house not too far away from here. So from 1920 uh, till about 1926, this is a private home. Now, as you might imagine, after the inauguration of Jack Kennedy, uh, the town of Brookline was quite proud of their native son. So they asked the owner of the house, um, an elderly woman named Mrs. Pollock, if they could place a photo of a bronze memorial uh, plaque dedicated to President Kennedy the the with a red, white, and, and so blue flower arrangement. Folks in the area um, would stop by. And in some cases, folks from out of town would actually go up to the front door, knock on the door of the house, uh, and ask to be uh, allowed in. And uh, apparently on occasion, uh, Mrs. Pollock would allow them uh, to come in. Um, 1963, of course, we have the assassination of the president. On uh, November 25th, uh, 1963, uh, President Johnson declares that day as a national day of mourning. Um, and the town of Brookline is going to put together a memorial ceremony uh, for um, uh, President Kennedy, so, which interestingly enough was originally organized by Brookline high school students um, and veterans of the Second World War. Uh, and what ended up happening is this small ceremony uh, became significantly larger. We have this great photograph, which hopefully we black can and white a photo bit, of large um, crowd gathered on Beale Street, Street in Brookline, filled uh, with mourners. And so, because this house became a focal point for grieving, there were conversations almost right away about turning this place into some kind of memorial or museum. But nothing's going to happen for a few years. Um, a member of the Kennedy family is going to approach the Pollock family about repurchasing the house. Um, and I think Mrs. Pollock was probably done with all the folks looking uh, in her windows and knocking on the door and uh, was kind enough to sell the home to the Kennedy family. And so what's going to happen is Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald Kennedy is going to Black and white photo site, of Rose uh, Fitzgerald Kennedy with, um, and Robert Lundington inside the JFK uh, birthplace. Which no longer exists. Um, and she's going to go about uh, recreating what this site looked like in 1917, wow. the year that Jack Kennedy uh, was born. So the plan was uh, to recreate the site um, and then work with the federal government uh, through the Congress and the National Park Service uh, to create the site. So um, the enabling legislation will pass for the site in 1967. And when she finished her work, um, she dedicates the site on the anniversary of the president's birth, May 29th, 1969. So at that point, uh, the site was open to the public uh, and has been 
since then. Mr. Price, did you want to share your thoughts with us? Well, I, I, that was a great A person with a tie appears before an office background. I am in the uh, John F. Kennedy Presidential Library at the moment, looking out at Dorchester Bay and on towards Boston. And, uh, you know, it's, it wasn't originally supposed to be here. Uh, when President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy were first thinking about where might a future presidential library uh, be situated, the assumption was it would be somewhere in Cambridge, probably near Harvard Square. Oh. And uh, as it turns out, the Cambridge City Council, with concerns about parking and tourism uh, numbers, uh, said that, no, you can't put it here. And so they had to look for alternative sites. And uh, it was a, a member of the Kennedy administration, uh, Dan Fenn, who later became the first director of this library, who uh, found this site here on the Columbia Point overlooking Dorchester Bay, brought Mrs. Kennedy out to it. There wasn't much developed here. It was a bit of a landfill and swamp marshy land. And uh, Mrs. Kennedy looked out at the view and said, Jack would have loved this. And so then they, uh, it was a bit of a controversial decision. They selected I.M. Pei as the architect for the building. Uh, he was, uh, happened to have also been born in 1917 and had quite a different vision for what this building might look like. And it was inspiring and Mrs. Kennedy approved it. And so we are, in addition to being uh, an archive repository, uh, also a museum for the public, we are also a memorial to a fallen president. And uh, I will say that uh, President Kennedy, in his, uh, in his conversations about what might be in it, he didn't want the focus to be on busts or portraits or images of him. Uh, and so I am Pei uh, made the decision that in the memorial space that we call the pavilion, there's just a large U.S. flag. Photo of large glass walls with a metal structure in front of them with a giant flag U.S. flag draping down. In 1979. My goodness. Fascinating. I've got to come visit you. Oh, you've got to come. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, please share with us your thoughts. At the time, a person in a suit jacket sits in front of a bookshelf. There were four presidential libraries in the federally run presidential library system. It was pretty clear that LBJ would have a presidential library of his own. He was, of course, a larger than life figure who was very attentive, as all presidents really are, to his legacy. And he clearly uh, wanted to go big with the institution that he would establish wherever that would be. And it, it, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that it would be on the UT Austin uh, campus, as has been mentioned, the University of Texas was very eager from an early point from 1965 to have the institution here where I'm sitting on the University of Texas campus. They put up about 15 million of the original $18 million that it took to build this institution and the neighboring LBJ School of Public Affairs. And it's in this way that the LBJ Library became the first of the presidential libraries to be built on a university campus. And not all of them since then, of course, have been built on campuses, but a few others have following the model that LBJ and, and UT mm -hmm. Austin um, es established. The library um, was uh, uh, the, very much the brainchild of Lyndon Johnson, but I would say even more so of the First Lady, Lady Bird Johnson, who took a very active interest in everything connected to the library, very much including its architecture. She um, uh, made many of the initial contacts that resulted in the selection of an architect named Gordon Bunshaft as the principal designer of the building. She oversaw many of the important steps in the construction of the building. She was inspired by by a couple of Bunshaft's other projects, including the Hirshhorn Gallery in Washington and the Beinecke Library at Yale University. And if you're uh, an architecture aficionado, I think you can see some similarities between this institution and, and other 
buildings um, that were built by the same architect. Uh, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. Uh, the library was dedicated on May 21st, 1971. So unfortunately, we had our big moment right in the teeth of the pandemic at a time when the library really wasn't open uh, for much action at all. But nevertheless, we found ways to celebrate what, what was a pretty a momentous milestone for this institution. LBJ was was here in this building for, alas, a fairly short time. He, of course, left the presidency in 1969 and passed away in January of 1973. But during those um, months and, well, small number of years, he was quite uh, active here in the library, spent a lot of time on site. And then for many, many years thereafter, Lady Bird Johnson was very much a, a presence here at the library. She passed away only in 2007 at the end of a very long uh, and an extraordinarily productive uh, life. So it's been a uh, historic last uh, year or so for this institution, and we're looking forward to the next 50. Phenomenal. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, it's always good to have a archives in library um, that is connected to your site. I know here at the Tuskegee Airmen and Tuskegee Institute National Historic Sites that I manage and at Selma to Montgomery Trail, we have um, several archives we work with and one is on the campus of Tuskegee University. And so um, uh, I think this next question kind of gets there because you do need partnerships like these to help you um, make sure you're doing the right thing when you're telling stories. And I think you all are doing that with our park. Joseph, we'd like to hear from you about LBJ. Well, as soon as Lyndon Johnson was reelected in 1964, in February of 1965, the University of Texas Regents uh, Director uh, William Heath proposed to have the LBJ Library built at the University of Texas. And today the library is right across from the stadium at University of Texas. President Johnson was always hands on with it. And in 1967, the construction began and mm -hmm. the fundraising was led by Lady Bird Johnson and they did some public and private fundraising. And the library was dedicated in May of 1971 with then uh, President Richard Nixon in attendance. And it is a definitely a 1960, 70 design of the library. Um, it has that feeling. And when you walk into it, it's a wonderful library with a lot of great archives, a wonderful introduction um, right after you go into the library. And uh, at the very top floor is the Johnson floor. That is where Lady Bird Johnson did a lot of her correspondence. And it's still, looks the same way it did when the president was alive. President Johnson in 1971 showed interest in having a national historical site because it was a historical site before it became a park. And one month before President Johnson passed away in December 1972, and President Johnson passed away in January 1973, 1972, he proposed the idea with Lady Bird and then Secretary of the Interior Stuart Udall to have the LBJ Ranch be part of the Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park. He designated about 680 acres of his 2,800 acre ranch to be part of the National Park. And it was a unique park because it was still protected by the Secret Service. So they had to come up with a plan for the public, for the visitors to visit the park, but still keep the presidential compound secure. So they, for a number of years, visitors had to get on a bus that was driven by Park Service employees. The first part of the ranch, which was the Junction School, which was the birthplace of the president and also the cemetery, those were able to be accessed to the visitors. However, to get directly to the Texas White House, visitors had to go on a bus or a trolley and it was a slow moving trolley so that way the visitors can get a good idea of how the ranch was and what the mm. and what the um, texas white house looked like now even though the visitors cannot get off the bus well that did not stop lady Bird johnson from visiting uh the visitors that came to the texas white house she would often correspond with them or talk to them uh, she'd be there um, at the house and she'd be talking to the people on the bus 
And once in a while, she would even get on the bus and give tours, be the tour director for the OBJ Ranch. Um, the Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical wow. Park was established later on, but Lyndon Johnson, he had a unique plan. The Johnson City District is where he was raised as from the age of five until pretty much uh, when he started running for U.S. Congress. That was where he was living. And so two parts of the park, one is the Johnson City District, which has the LBJ settlement of his grandfather, Sam. Ely Johnson Sr. And the other park is the LBJ Ranch, which is 14 miles away from Johnson City between Johnson City and Fredericksburg. Thank you so much, Joseph, for that. Um, I tell you, that Lady Bird Johnson is something else. We all love her. Our next question for all of you all is how do these parks institutions interpret the lives of these great men? I'll go ahead and start again. I think um, what's quite interesting about um, our site is that initially when it opened, I, I might have mentioned this before, is uh, Rose Kennedy made recordings of her recollections of what went on in the house. When folks first came to visit the house in 1969, really up until um, the mid-1990s, they would come to the front door and they would walk through uh, the house itself. There, were, there are gates in front, but they'd push doorbell-like buttons in front of the room, mm -hmm. activating the recordings. And so the entire home and the entire experience uh, was literally seen through her, um, through her eyes and her interpretation, which was quite moving for folks. But by the mid 1990s, early 2000s, um, the Park Service made the choice to kind of transform uh, tours, actually have tours of the house where a ranger would do interpretation while playing some of the recordings. Um, and so we attempt to offer some context for the, 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 the history of the nation at that point, but also make connections between the past and the present, talk about uh, the formative years of the president. Um, in the past 20 seasons that I've been there, we've expanded that a little bit. Um, we talk about the first 10 years. So not only in the house that's behind me, the birth house, also the home black and white photo of kennedy family second here. home in brookline um, so many dormers and wraps around the porch are here. visible uh, you've got joe kennedy um beginning to make a substantial fortune during the time period you're living in brookline through investments in film production um and the stock market uh you have rose kennedy uh, uh taking on two new identities first a wife and then a mother um but also retaining an intellectual life uh, as well and sort of forming um the lives of her children and sort of shaping them uh in that way so few people remember that when this museum first opened, the first exhibit was actually uh, about the assassination. Mm. And it was too powerful a start and perhaps too close to the event, though it was 79, that a lot of visitors uh, would see that and in about 10 or 15 minutes simply leave crying. They did not mm. see the rest of the exhibits. So it all had to be reworked. Uh, and done differently. And so now uh, the, the main exhibit hall, we have a permanent gallery and we have temporary galleries that rotate. The, the permanent gallery focuses on the, the life and legacy. Essentially, we pick up where the birth home left off oh. uh, and we start uh, all the way through the campaign. And then you get to walk through the different aspects of the campaign and the first televised debate with Nixon and the inaugural address. And as was mentioned, Joe Kennedy's Hollywood, his film uh, background and enthusiasm, uh, I think makes a huge difference for our library. We have so much film footage of Kennedy and of the events and of the family and of the children that uh, in so many ways, when that was broadcast during the White House years and the kids were on magazine covers and Everybody wanted to know whether the hair was parted on the left side or the right side, or did John Jr. have a new tooth come in? All of this is recorded oh in ways that gives the visitor a true sense of what it might have been like during that era. Uh, because we have all the footage, we have uh, the great speeches, we have the uh, the press corps briefings uh, on mm -hmm. video. So that because it is a very uh, photogenic and videogenic family. So much of that yes. is on display. Um, we tend to mm -hmm. rotate in the temporary galleries between more lighthearted subjects and more serious subjects. 
So currently we have, uh, what was it like to grow up as children in the White House as an exhibit? But next spring, uh, we'll rotate that out and we'll reopen the temporary gallery with World War II, uh, starting with PT Boat 109, the conflict in the Pacific Theater, and ultimately uh, we will uh, have a display of all the names of the fallen in World War II. So that'll be a much more serious exhibit that I hope will attract uh, a nationwide following a lot of uh, veterans to come and visit. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the most popular thing in the history of our displays, of course, is Mrs. Kennedy's dresses. Oh, and yes. Yes. Oh, yes. And so oh, yes. I'll just tell you right now, uh, because of there are limitations with how often you can expose them to light, that the next time we will pull out all the dresses will be in 2029, which will celebrate the 100th anniversary of Mrs. Kennedy's birth. Oh, wow. I've got to be there for that. And, you know, one of the things that I'm proud of uh, establishing here, if you've ever been to a bookstore that has a staff picks selection on the shelf, mm -hmm. some of the staff recommend these novels or these other books, we have a staff picks from the archives display because oh you know, we have so many documents and photographs that may never fit a themed exhibit, mm. millions and millions of them that would otherwise not see the light of day, but our archivists know about them and think they're really interesting and the public should see them. And so we rotate that about three times a year and archivists can pick any photograph or document they want and write a little blurb about why they think this is historically significant or just sheds an interesting bit of light on the administration of the family. And they have total discretion to do that. And so uh, that'll change, uh, like I say, three times a year. If you come and just look at that, you'll be amazed. Uh, there could be letters that are written in or famous people who came through the White House during a particular period of time. Uh, we've got a photograph up now of uh, Danny Kaye, uh, you know, talking to the president while Judy Garland is kicking back on the, the presidential desk, smoking a cigarette. All right, Joseph, same question. How do these parks institutions interpret the lives of these great men? That's a good question. And in Johnson City Historical District, which is National Historical Park in Johnson City, we give the interpretation of the influences of what led to the path of Lyndon Johnson and the presidency at the boyhood home, which is right across the street from the visitor center. That's where we talk about Sam Lee Johnson Jr. and his political career. And that's how we talk about Rebecca Baines Johnson and her education and how she would bring students over and give them a great lesson in education. And also we talk about the influences of the house with the education of Lyndon Johnson and the politics. On the front porch is where Lyndon Johnson made his very first political speeches in 1937. And so that was the path, the, the launching point of the path that led him to the White House. And at the LBJ Ranch, we kind of give, well, we do give an interpretation of how Lyndon Johnson had a connection with the Hill Country of Texas, how he would come back from Washington, D.C., and how he would spend so much time at the ranch and the connection with the hill country, with the peacefulness of the ranch that he came to love. But we also talk about the things that happen at the ranch that would influence America to this day. When President Johnson set up the park, he said, I want this park to be about what happened here, not what I did. What, not because of me, but what happened here. So we give the interpretation of the many meetings he had with world leaders, how he would get together with former President Harry Truman and they would talk about Medicare and Medicaid. Um, he would meet with the Prime Minister of Israel during the 1967 Israeli uh, war and how he would talk with uh, the Israeli Prime Minister there in the Texas White House. The house was a place of peace for Lyndon Johnson, but also it was a political tool. President Johnson, former President Truman, and Mexican and President to, Mateos at LBJ Ranch. What he was thinking, what was good for America and for the world. And so with the Texas White House, we also talk about the history of the house, how it was built, and how it would suit Lyndon Johnson later on um, when he was in the Senate and as president and his final years. Uh, we talk about the final years of Lyndon Johnson once he left the presidency 
and how he would stay at the ranch and ma manage it just like he'd managed the presidency, micromanaging it, and how uh, the ranch hands would have to deal with Lyndon Johnson every day about his, his specific instructions. But the main theme overall with the, with the boyhood home, with the place in Johnson City, that is the path that led Lyndon Johnson to the White House. That was the beginning of the influences that he would take with them, with education, also with politics. And then at the LBJ Ranch is where we would talk about the Senate years, how he would come to Texas um, just to relax, just to get away from the hectic life of Washington, D.C., but also how it was an important on the world stage because many, many times the national news would broadcast from the LBJ Ranch in the Texas White House. And also there in the president's office at the Texas White House is where he would have his very last interview with Walter Cronkite just a little less than a month before he died. And so the LBJ Ranch was a place of peace and influence, and the Johnson City District was the influences to the path that led him to the White House. Thank you so much, Joseph. Mark, Thanks, please Joy. share with us your <laughs> thoughts. So you ask about how we interpret Lyndon Johnson's life yes. and, and presidency. And I have two answers for that. And the, the first answer um, is, is to emphasize that we are, I think, first and foremost, an archive. And in this respect, mm -hmm. it, we're very conscious of not interpreting Lyndon Johnson. In other words, our doors are open for researchers to come here and to read the documentary record, look at the photographs, listen to the audio and so forth, and form their own judgments. And I think that this approach is, of course, at the core of what archives generally are about and certainly what the Presidential Library archives are about as well. I think what I'm saying would apply across the system. But Lyndon Johnson was really adamant um, in his speech on the dedication day of the LBJ Library. He said to his audience and to the nationwide audience, in fact, that was watching over uh, television, um, it's all here with the bark off, a very Lyndon Johnson kind of uh, phrase. In other words, he wanted people to come and see the the record for themselves and form their, their own judgments. And I think, and I certainly hope, that that spirit of openness and invitations to people to come and, and form their own conclusions informs how, um, how this institution is, is positioned. But that said, I take your, your question as really uh, directed toward how in our museum we interpret the life and times of LBJ, fair enough. Um, this is, of course, a tricky business because LBJ is such a complicated figure. He is the man who gave us some of the greatest, or I should say who signed at least, and supported certainly some of the most transformative legislation in American history, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964, yes. the Voting Rights Act of 1965, yes. the Immigration yes. Act, and the War on Poverty, and so forth, and so on. He is also the president most closely associated with Vietnam, and I think probably rightfully so. What is the balance? that we should strike, really that anyone should strike in thinking about Lyndon Johnson between what many of us, I think, would, would say stand out as these momentous accomplishments and uh, on the other side, these uglier dimensions of the, the Johnson presidency. And I would say perhaps unsurprisingly, the balance that we strike in our museum exhibits has changed over the years. When this institution was first opened, there was precious little about Vietnam. Over the years, as our exhibits have been refreshed and renovated, there's been more and more and more. And I think now we have an exhibit that, you know, comes down heavier on the domestic accomplishments. But Vietnam is very present um, in the exhibit as well. And I think that that's a major step forward and brings us a lot closer to the goal um, that I would certainly have in my mind of presenting Lyndon Johnson and his presidency as objectively and fairly as possible in a way that people will find provocative. I think one of the most interesting questions about LBJ is how could the same man, the same presidency, give us this wide array of accomplishments and and big problems and, and, and big setbacks? We also um, tried to emphasize, and I think increasingly as time passes, this is important, the long-term legacies of the Johnson presidency. So when you're talking about these transformative legislative accomplishments of the Johnson presidency, you're talking about 
pieces of legislation that really still shape the world that we live in today, certainly in the arena of race relations is absolutely, I think, the case in terms of um, everyday expectations about the relationship between government and ordinary citizens um, in arenas like um, uh, the social safety net, immigration policy, the environment, and on and on one could go. A lot of what stands today uh, stems directly, I think, from the Lyndon Johnson presidency. So it's very important for us mm -hmm. to leave our visitors with a sense that the Johnson presidency was not only a historical episode, a really interesting historical episode connected to the 1960s, which is always going to be a fascinating focal point, I think, of historical inquiry. But it's also a period that established, in many ways, many of the public policies and everyday expectations that citizens hold in their heads about their, um, their place in the country and the responsibility of government toward toward everyday people. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, it's funny as I hear you speak, I can't think of, can't help but to think about um, the Voting Rights Act and um, why one of my parks exists, the Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail. In fact, the scene behind me are elementary, junior high and high school students protesting voting rights. And so I just wanted to make sure you knew that um, because it's very important to us here. Um, in addition to the other civil rights sites in the Park Service that um, existed uh, during the Kennedy administration, of course, not as national parks, but they recognize um, things that existed like Freedom Riders, um, the Emmett, uh, Emmett Till sites that are about to come on in addition to the Maker Evers home um, in Mississippi. And so we have one more question. Uh, this could go on much longer, but we have one more question for you all. What are the most important lessons we can learn in the 21st century from these figures? Jonathan, would you like to start this conversation? Would be, I would be happy to, Joy. But I do want to make a couple connections here. And you set the table Please. quite nicely in terms of um, and and um, both Alan and Mark and, and Joe sort of got to this a moment ago, but in terms of talking about places, but items, right? And I think these tangible things that, that obviously visitors can't touch the items, but they can see them, right? And I think, you know, Joey talking about Jackie Kennedy's dresses, it's just, yes. it's one thing to see the image, but if you're standing in front of the dress, that's, you're that much closer to this person who's no longer. Very here. much um, so. And, you know, Alan, as you spoke about too, we're sort of, we cover kind of part one of the story. You folks do kind of part two, um, but even that space, uh, and I always talk about this when I do a tour downtown, um, the great grandparents of Jack Kennedy would have sailed right by that location. Uh, and, wow. and, and nowhere in their wildest dreams could they've ever imagined that one of their own would eventually become the first Irish American Catholic president of the United okay. States, but there's that sense of place. Um, Mark and Joe, I had the chance to, to get out to Texas back in December, um, and uh, Joe, I can't tell you how moving it was to stand literally in between um, LBJ's birthplace and his gravesite, uh, and it was great. I, I was there in December, and no one else was there, so I was able to have that moment on my own, and, you know, given everything that's been going on with COVID, I got pretty emotional, so it was, you know, as a history geek, it was, was great to, to be able to do that, and Mark, just to touch back a bit, uh, the lap, I would, had a chance to take my kids, uh, we were there in December, to the LBJ uh, Library Museum, excuse me, Museum, and the last time I was there in 99, and it was a very different place uh, in 1999 in terms of displays, but what was great is my eight-year-old daughter was really enjoying listening to the recordings, the phone mm -hmm. conversations between the president and Rose Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy and wow. Dr. King, and again, she can read, she can understand what's going on, but hearing these people who are long deceased, being in the space where all these items are, it means everything. So, and, and Joy, as you mentioned a moment ago, I, I've never been uh, to, uh, to Tuskegee. Uh, I can't wait to walk across the bridge at some point, but these spaces uh, are very, very important in terms of, of what we do. So kind of connecting off of that, I think um, probably the biggest lessons for, uh, for us, the birthplaces, People sort of assume uh, that, that Jack Kennedy, and probably to a lesser extent, LBJ, were sort of born into greatness. They were destined to become these uh, significant figures 
Uh, they, they came out of the womb being able to speak articulately uh, and to write and to lead. And that's just not the case. They're human beings, uh, just right. like anyone else. And I think um, Jack Kennedy uh, struggled with illness. Uh, there were numerous times over the course of his life that he nearly died and he lived in pain uh, nearly every single day of his life. And I think a lot of visitors are surprised to find uh, that out. And I think those are important lessons in terms of uh, perseverance, in terms of courage, obviously he'll write uh, a book, which I would argue is sort of him kind of trying to figure out things for himself, profiles of courage. But the other thing I find particularly interesting and important about the Kennedy story and Fitzgerald's story is that um, it very much connects with major themes uh, in American mm -hmm. history. We've mentioned civil rights, right? They're definitely late to uh, the, the, the game on civil rights, but they get there eventually, right? Um, the immigrant experience, um, the urban politics, uh, 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 the role of the Irish, um, the suburban experience, um, Hollywood, whatever it might be of all these different themes that you kind of weave together. And I think if you simply focus on, hey, he became president, it simplifies this extraordinarily complex story. So um, as Mark was saying a moment ago, I think to me, one of the most fascinating things about LBJ is you have this man who literally is, is personifying all these things simultaneously. And it makes it that much more interesting. It's, you know, my students will say, what, what should I think of him? I was like, figure it out on your own, right? As Mark was saying, the whole point of this is to present these folks with information, allow them to look at the documents, allow uh, them to read this information and then to try to make sense of it and to make connections as well, right? That's really our job at both National Historic Sites, National Park Sites uh, and Presidential Library Museums to make those connections uh, and allow folks to uh, come to their own conclusions about uh, who these people were uh, and what meaning they have for us today. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I, I'm excited to pick up where you just uh, left off. I mean, there's there's so many lessons one can learn. And one of the, to me, joys of living in a relatively young nation is that this history is not that far back. Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, and so for, you know, because Kennedy does not get to live his full life, we forget how his life could have extended into our consciousness, right? He's, there's only three years difference between him and President Nixon, only six years difference uh, in the other direction between him and uh, President Bush 41. Uh, you know, imagine if he had lived a full life, what he would have seen and what he could have done. Um, I am Pei was born in 1917, and as it turns out, my wife's grandfather was born in 1917, and he is still living. I spoke with him two days what? ago. Wow. Right? And so for many people, 1917 is still, you know, it is a lived experience. It is not ancient history. And so, uh, you know, 1960s is not that far back. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm excited that we can be part of an exhibit that, uh, actually resonates well today. I am grateful for President Johnson because much of what President Kennedy is famous for, uh, Johnson actually picked up the baton and got it across the finish line. Uh, things like the moonshot, though I'm sure Nixon would take credit for it. Uh, you know, the, the actual putting a man on the moon happens under the Nixon administration, but uh, the, the resources, the focus, the science, the, the details, Johnson managed that from the beginning. And though President Kennedy said, you know, we're going to put a man on this moon in this decade, um, and that inspiration has worked for generations uh, to inspire other bold initiatives. Uh, there's a connection between uh, Johnson and Kennedy that's inescapable. I think that... Um, like a few presidents, President Kennedy is also known for, as was mentioned earlier, uh, courage, with both with his Profile and Courage and the Legacy, which is now the Profile and Courage Award, uh, particularly focusing on political courage. Uh, his inaugural address, uh, where many people who cannot name a single quote of any president uh, will still remember the words, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, your country. Yes. right? And, and whether it was serving in the Peace Corps or any number of other capacities, a lot of people got that notion of 
national service or community service from Kennedy. I think uh, I think that's extraordinary. Um, I don't want to forget because uh, Mark, you mentioned something earlier. There's something about the media, and particularly Walter Cronkite, that connects these two presidents. <laughs> That's really extraordinary. Uh, he is very much a part of um, both of these presidencies. Uh, he is very much in wonder uh, about putting a man on the moon, and he is very much in mourning at the assassination of President Kennedy. And if I could just add two other quick things. Uh, President Kennedy is very well known for his stance uh, on immigration and the importance of immigration to this great nation. And, and finally, I would say that diplomacy matters. You, you can't forget that during the height of the Cold War and a nuclear arms race, where anything could escalate uh, into something that you can't come back from, that he was able to personally connect with people in a way that transcended uh, diplomatic differences. Uh, both he and Mrs. Kennedy uh, were able to uh, connect to people in ways that just inspired them. And I think their, their image of them as the first family humanized both the White House and for people living abroad, humanized the United States in a way that I think made it harder to go to war. Uh, and so I, I do... Uh, I do think words matter. I do think diplomacy matters. And uh, those words are still relevant today as we continue to face uh, potential tensions and conflict with other nations. Wow. Thank you so much. Joseph, uh, what are the most important lessons we can learn in the 21st century from these figures? I believe the most lessons we can learn is taking triumphs from tragedy when. President Kennedy was killed. A few weeks or a few days later, President Johnson addressed the joint, uh, joint Congress, and he said, let us continue. In other words, he said he was taking the civil rights movement, which he knew was not, that was President Kennedy's initiative that President Johnson acknowledged. And he knew he had a limited amount of time to get it passed. He knew that Vietnam was on the horizon, he knew that there was going to be problems with legislation, but he also knew that it was an opportunity to get things done that helped all Americans with the civil rights movement, with the great society. So we try to tell visitors about Lyndon Johnson's contributions that we're enjoying today. Um, when President Kennedy was supposed to visit the LBJ Ranch on November 22nd, 1963, um, one thing which you were talking about, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan was talking about President Kennedy's illness with his back. President Johnson had a mattress that was as hard as a rock that was going to be in the Kennedy bedroom upstairs on the second floor. And Unfortunately, the mattress is had not been shown to the public. However, it shows that President Kennedy Black and was white going to photo visit of the ranch. Senators and also, Johnson and Kennedy in smiling in a crowd of press and onlookers at the, the LBJ and ranch. So he was directly involved with the LBJ ranch. President Johnson, though, was a complex man. He did great, great triumphs with American society, but it also came with a tremendous cost. When the civil rights movement was passed, he said that he was going to lose the South for 100 years. In other words, he knew that the Democratic Party would struggle trying to get as powerful as it used to be because of the civil rights movement. But he did not care. He knew that was going to be a sacrifice. So we show the human figure and also the triumph and tragedies of Lyndon Johnson. Also, one thing which we do interpret as well to let visitors know is how important Lady Bird Johnson 1948 was campaign, Linda B. BJ. Johnson with Lady Bird, she Linda, with and Lucy Johnson. On. How did he sound for a speech? We have phone conversations that we have in our visitor center at the hangar at the ranch where he is asking Lady Bird Johnson, how did I do on the speech? And she said, well, I give you a B plus, but you need to slow down a little bit when you address the nation. And so he really relied on her. And she was a beloved figure, not only in Texas, but in the United States. And without Lady Bird Johnson, I dare say, President Johnson would not accomplish as much as he did in the limited amount of time that he was uh, 
in the honeymoon period of his presidency. Mm -hmm. He knew Vietnam was going to be a big, big stumbling block. And he was frustrated with, he said, I have opportunities I wanted to pursue, but because of Vietnam, I'm not able to do that. So we kind of give that lesson as well. But also we do give the lesson of how President Johnson connected with the world when he invited the Israeli Prime Minister. 1965, Prime Minister, President Johnson with Bush Canadian Chancellor Prime Minister. To come out to the ranch and talk about policies that we still enjoy to this day. And so we talk about the triumphs and some of the tragedies and also the complexity of Lyndon Johnson because Photograph so of Lyndon B. Johnson at LBJ Ranch. Said she didn't know all the sides of her husband. And so it's a mysterious figure with Lyndon Johnson, but he was so important with, especially with today, with the civil rights movement. He said, and he knew that they were going to come a long way, but they had a long, long way to go. And he was the man who took President Kennedy's ideas and continued with them. And that's one thing we do try to show at the LBJ Ranch and also at the Johnson uh, Boyhood Home in Johnson City. Mark? Thanks, Joy. Um I'll start by um, just saying um, how much I appreciated what Alan was saying a few minutes ago about the nearness of much of this history. Though the 1960s seems so far away in certain respects, it also seems so familiar. How often have we all probably been asked over the last few years to compare the 1960s or perhaps 1968 above all with the social disorder, or the political fragmentation, the partisanship that we've seen in, in recent years. Um, it's not a big stretch of the imagination to see that the 1960s are remarkably similar in certain respects to the era that we're yes. living through and of course helped to shape the era that we're living through in all kinds of really profound ways, though this is 50 years ago, in some ways it seems much, much less than that. And yet I would also suggest that there are certain ways in which the Johnson presiden presidency seems like 500 years ago. And, and in, in my point here are a couple of lessons of the Johnson period that I would emphasize. I think Lyndon Johnson's presidency and his style of leadership suggests what is possible when political elites take a pragmatic approach to problem solving, mm -hmm. back away from ideological commitments and seek coalitions, approach the problems of American societies, including the biggest problems of American society, segregation, poverty, environmental degradation, and so forth, in a spirit of bipartisan problem solving. So, you know, not everybody liked LBJ, that's for sure. He didn't necessarily like everyone, but he knew how to how to uh, convince people to at least seriously consider his point of view. He knew how to build coalitions. And I think that that's a style of politics that is, as many commentators have pointed out, lacking from our current moment. Now, the, the context of the current moment is so different that I think it would be impossible for Lyndon Johnson or anyone like him to work the same magic that LBJ was able to work in a very different political setting in the, in the 1960s. But nevertheless, I think his career does show Show that someone who um, occupies high office, who brings a spirit of problem solving and a willingness to work in a bipartisan fashion and to form ever shifting coalitions on different issues, you know, is probably well suited to at least making some headway on the big problems of the day. And I think related to this is another lesson of Lyndon Johnson's presidency. You know, Lyndon Johnson is, I think, well known for being the um, the champion of these major legislative accomplishments of the 1960s. And, 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 and it's legitimate to see him in this way. But across, if you take a broader view of his entire presidency, I think you can easily see that he was a, a shapeshifter. He was adaptable. He was flexible. Let's face it, he voted against civil rights every single time for decades before in the late 1950s he had a change of heart. He was a quite conservative, hawkish cold warrior in 
the 1940s and 1950s before he assumed a different posture during his presidency. And some people might look at this record and say, well, here's someone who flip-flopped or someone who, you know, didn't know who he was. But I think there's a lesson in this as well, that this is someone who was flexible, who was willing to bend with the moment and to see um, that different moments demanded different solutions in a way that mm -hmm. helped him to... Um, to steer clear of firm ideological commitments that could never be compromised under any circumstances. I am just so happy that we had this conversation today. We are out of time. This is the end of our JFK and LBJ, the New Frontier and the Great Society webisode series. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey to look at the humanity of JFK and LBJ as leaders who influenced the trajectory of this nation and made it better like we strive to do every day as we tell their stories in a deeper, richer way. Again, thank you for joining us and you take care. Credit slides of white text on a black background roll. Identifying and thanking those who appeared in the video and those who helped edit and produce the video series. 